Good day to you. It's good to be here today as we look at, I think, some people that I have not thought of and, and giving some what I call uh, people that we can learn from that doesn't have a whole lot to say about them in God's Word. And we are going to look at one now, a story that I think everybody knows, and everybody knows, the, I would say, the main character. And that's going to be in, in John, if we look at John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Now in this, when I say John chapter 4, I think most of you are going to say it's about the Samaritan woman at the well. And that is the main character in this. In this, We will read a little bit about her, but I, I want us to look at some other people that's in this that I think kind of illustrates something that hit me as being uh, unique. In this chapter 4, it says, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Philistines had heard that Jesus, uh, that, that heard that Jesus made and baptized more than John, disciples than John, it says, though Jesus himself uh, did not baptize, but his disciples, he left Judah and departed again to Galilee. He, Judah, and then he went back to Galilee. In between was Samaria. Now it says this. It says he needed to go through Samaria. He needed to go through Samaria. I would say this. It was not the practice of what we would say Orthodox and strong Jews to go through Samaria. Because the Samaritans was, was basically half Jews. In the sense they did not believe anything of the Old Testament but the five books of, books of law. That's all they, they believed in. Matter of fact, even today there are Samaritans that still practice the Samaritan religion. Back uh, here a while back I heard there was just over a thousand. I looked it up today and today there's only, they, they say 900 Samaritans left in the world. Did you believe that? 900, making it one of the oldest and smallest religious groups that there is in the world today. I do know that a friend of mine that lived down in Brazil, there was a Samaritan that he baptized that came from there in Palestine, came over to Brazil and ended up, was, was baptized in the Lord's church. That's the only one I know of that was ever baptized. Back then, uh, uh, there was over, over a thousand, and that was 20-some years ago. Now they say there's 900. I saw at the end of World War I in 1919, they said there was only a, about 150. Does that make sense? But they grew back, but it's small. But they was known and they was not liked. They was even called dogs by the Jews, and they treated them that way. They thought of them, it was worse than anything that we knew in this country back in the, during the, the time of the, of, of the blacks and the white and the prejudice when I was a small child. It was worse than that. They wouldn't even want them to handle their food or anything else. But notice, it says, but he needed to go through Samaria. It wasn't talking about the trip. It was talking about he needed to go through Samaria. And I think we're going to see a great lesson there. Matter of fact, maybe even more lesson than some people realize when we look at this. It says he needed to go through. He said he left again and he left and departed and went through. And it says then he came to a certain city and, and where the ground where Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Then, now Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, set this by the well. It was around the sixth hour. We would say 12 o'clock, 12 noon. And a woman of Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me, a, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, asked a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? 
For Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. They wouldn't even have a dealing. Matter of fact, they would have thought a cup that was handed to them by a Samaritan would be a dirty cup. And they couldn't drink of the water. And this surprised the woman. And Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew that if you knew the gift of God and who is it who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Living water. And the woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? And I say this, and, and I tried to look this up and it's hard to find, but we think of living water, what was he using? I, I don't know if y'all have heard the term, but when I was a small boy, my uncle and aunt moved out and bought an 80 acre farm and, and didn't have a house really on it, had a barn on it and had a well on it. And I remember my uncle was so thrilled because he said he had a live well. Now, I, I, I haven't heard that much, but in Oklahoma sometimes I heard they had live wells. Somebody said, what's the difference between a live and a dead well? <laughs> well, a live well was the sense that that well, and I can remember we used to let down before he got the house all plumbed in, they had to go draw water from the well. And I can remember loving to go out there and with the older boys, they would let that down and we would pull it back up and that water was so cold and so refreshing. But it was funny, you could listen and the water was moving. You could hear the water moving in the well because my uncle and my dad said, well, it's a live, it's a live well. Meaning they had dug it, dug it and we call it hit a spring. But the water was cold, the water was moving. And because of that, my uncle, they didn't have to worry about the well drying up. It was living water, alive. It wasn't a catch basin. Some wells in all over the world are wells that just fill up with rain and then, you know, they can dry up during the season. But she said, this is a living, I, give me that living water. Now, he was talking about a little different water, but I would think that maybe she understood that he was saying the well was good, the water was good. But notice, he went on to said to her, to said to her, sir, you have nothing to draw. And you get it, it says, and you, are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? He drank from it, his son, it, what happened? It didn't go dry. <laughs> <laughs> are you are you got something greater than this? They, the men drank from it, the stock drank from it, and it didn't go dry. Hey, that was a good well. But Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drank of this water will thirst again. But whosoever drank of the water that shall give him that I shall give him would never thirst. But the water that I give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up unto everlasting life. What? Not that he wouldn't get thirsty again, but the water that he was going to give was going to give them what? Everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. She thought he was still thinking about, talking about physical water. Hey, take a drink and never have to drink again. And Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Then Jesus looked at her and said this, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truth. Wow. Somebody that didn't know him, wasn't her people, never seen before, a Jew that didn't talk to, didn't talk to her people. And all of a sudden he looked and said, you said, well, there's been five men that had divorced her. Gave her writing divorce, but five men. And this one had not even married to her, was just living with her, but not married to her. And Jesus knew it. 
when he, she heard this, you have said, well, notice. And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worship in this mountain. And you Jews say in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Now look, he said, she said, I, I see that you are a prophet, but <laughs> basically she was trying to tell him, you are a prophet, but you're not my prophet. <laughs> he, she was, he was a Jew, right? You aren't my prophet. But he noticed, you aren't my prophet. But Jesus clarified that very well. Because here Jesus, Jesus said, it said this. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will, will neither worship in this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. Salvation is of the Jews. Not salvation is for the Jews only, but it's of the Jews. Matter of fact, the purpose of the Jews was the, the Jews, the seed of Abraham, the seed of David, was to bring salvation to the whole world. Even those dirty dogs they called Samaritans. <laughs> That's what they was for. And notice in verse 23, it says, but the hour is coming. And now it, it is coming and it is now. It, basically, it's coming and it is now. It says, it is now when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. I'm going to say this, the Samaritans in a lot of ways, I believe they worship God in spirit. They worship God. They believed in God. Because basically, we're going to see that they even knew about the Messiah. Did you know that? They knew about the Messiah. They knew the Messiah was going to come. But the thing about it is, they didn't follow the law the way that they should. They had that spirit of knowing about God, but they wasn't following in truth. But it says, you need to do this. And the woman said to him, I know, I know, that, 25, listen, listen. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. This woman that only had the first five books of the Old Testament knew the Messiah what? What's coming. It's taught in the, in the Bible. It's taught to Abraham. It's taught. It's in the first five books. It's in the prophets also. But even it's in there enough that the woman knew the, the Samaritans knew that there was going to come a Messiah. It says, I know the Messiah is coming who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. He will tell what? Us all things. She had to know the Messiah was coming, going to tell off. And bad of fact, if she knew that, she knew it would probably come to and through the Jews. Because that was taught there too. Who it was going to come through. It was going to come through a person that was not of the Samaritan. It was going to come through of the seed of David. And notice, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you are he. And at this point, the disciples came and marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, why do you, why do you seek or, or why are you talking with her? The woman then left. And I like this because then it says the woman left and the woman went back and she walked and, and told the men of the village. She said, come, see a man who told me all things that I have ever done. Come, could this be the Christ? She didn't say this is the Christ. You teach by sometimes asking questions. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. These were Samaritans. I tell you what, I, I think these men are the ones I want to talk about. These men were Samaritans. These men knew what the Jews thought of them. They knew they called them, they thought of them as dogs. But even they knew about the Messiah. And she 
told them. He knew everything that I knew. And it says that they went out of the city and came to him. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat, which of you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? Then Jesus said to him, My food is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish the work. Do you not see there are still four months, and then cometh the harvest? Behold, I say to you, Lift up your eyes and look at the field, for they are already white for harvest. By the way, I think he looked up and he saw those people coming. He saw that people from town, those men from town coming. And he said, and he said, and he said, He who reapeth receiveth wages, and gather fruit for eternal life. But both he who sows and who reaps may rejoice together. For in the saying it is true, one soweth and another reap, reapeth. I sent you to reap, and for which you have not labored. Others have labored and have entered into their rest. Others had labors. Who had labored? Did you know who labored? The prophets of old. The Messiah was known because of what other people had done. Not the disciples, but those men of the past. Those men that wrote, the Moses that wrote the old law, those that repeated it and made copies of the old law, they had been those that had done what needed to be done. In verse 39, I love this. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the words of the woman who testified. He told me all that I had done. People testified of what she testified. We we don't sometimes don't say testified, but I think it's true. What what do you mean testified? She shared what Jesus had told her. She shared what Jesus had done for her. Told her. You know, the Samaritan men, I think. They was counted as being the lowest people in the world. They really was. The Jews thought of them as the lowest people in the world. There was the Gentiles, the lowest of the, you know, there was the Gentiles, there was the Greeks, and then under them was the Romans, but at the very bottom was the Samaritans. But the gospel was for what? The Samaritans, the weakest, the poorest, Somebody said, should we go to them? Yes, we should go to all people. But you know, the second point of this lesson, in the same chapter, in the same almost breath of the gospel, he shows the high and the low. Somebody said, what are you talking about? Well, let's look on. And we are about done, but I got to show you this. Because it says that he, he, he left them after two days staying with them, but in 45. So when he came to Galilee, the Galilean received him, having seen all the things he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also had gone to the feast. So Jesus came to Canaan of the Galilee, where he had made his, his, the water wine. And there was a certain noble whose son was sick at Capernaum. There was a certain what? Noble. He was a noble. What? Okay. In the pyramid, there was a lot of people. Who was at the top of the pyramid? The nobles. <laughs> Isn't it funny? He had just left the bottom of the pyramid. And many of them believed and came to Christ, came to the Messiah. And then all of a sudden he came up and there was a man, a what? A noble. I don't know who this noble's name was, but he was a noble. And notice that he came and said, and we heard that Jesus had come out of Judea to Galilee. He went to him and imposed him and said, come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. And Jesus said to him, unless you unless you people see signs and wonders 
you will be by no means believe. He said, you know, because we know it. I think we know it. So oftentimes, the more noble a person is, and that usually, we call it rich or powerful. So oftentimes, them are the hardest to reach with the gospel. You know that. You know that. Don't, I mean, it's just hard to do. Somebody's got everything they need and more than they need. Sometimes it's hard to show them the importance of the gospel until something happened. Here it was. His son was sick. That noble came to him. He said, you know, y'all won't pay any, you know, you do not, uh, you know. Well, notice. The noble said to him, sir, come down before my child died. He said, come down. Why? Before he died. Because he knew Jesus could save him. That was implied in his answer, was it not? And Jesus said to him, go your way, your son liveth." So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and he went his way. He believed Jesus. He didn't keep on saying, come with me. He didn't say, come with me, I'll give you a bunch of money. He had the same faith that woman did. He had that same faith that them Samaritan men and people had. That same faith. Because he said, he said, go, you'll... F so he left. And when he was on the way back, his men came meeting him. Why? To tell him the good news. Your son is healed. He's well again. And the man, noble man said, what time was it? And it's funny because he said, they said it was yesterday at the seventh hour. And he said... That's the time that the Jesus spoke to me and said he is healed. Isn't it something in the same chapter? We have Jesus converting. We have Jesus speaking to the elite and what people counted the dogs. Who's the gospel for? Who is the gospel for? All men, all men, those that may be living in mud huts and those that might be living in ivory towers, the gospel is needed for all men. And we should be like Christ, not ashamed. Listen to me, not ashamed to talk to those that might be our nobles or those that might be what called the scum of the earth because all of them everyone every man and woman and child on this earth can come to Christ because there's no other way but the way that we read of in God's word remember that no matter where you are no matter who you are the gospel is for you God be with you till we meet again.